Many times we refer to the Holy Spirit and, um, and sometimes we have a conversation with others about the, the transcendent reality of the divine nature, the transcendent reality of Jesus having returned to his Father, our Father's love for us, and how the, Jesus says of him and the Father, we will come to him and make our home with him. And that's very, very powerful. And those who are children of God have been sealed and redeemed by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And so on our, we, we have various lists of distinctive statements that help us identify ourselves to a broader community of who we are. And the number one item on the list is the preeminence of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father who came from the Father, who returned to the Father. And the second one is that we are spirit-formed, or some texts say we are spirit-led. I want to focus on that just for a few moments, because what does it mean to be spirit-formed, spirit-led? Um, if somebody asks you about the Holy Spirit, how will you respond? Somebody asked me this week, John, I want you to pray to the Holy Spirit. So what would you say when somebody said, I want you to pray to the Holy Spirit? And, um, and, and that's a loving friend of mine whom I have great respect for, and they're on a different journey or slightly different trajectory. And how would you respond to, uh, with a biblical answer? And my first response was, can you show me a biblical example of someone praying to the Holy Spirit. And, um, and so we had this conversation talking about the nature of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guides. The Holy Spirit counsels. The Holy Spirit seals us for the day of glory. It convicts us of sin and of righteousness. And when we read the scriptural narrative, we realise that young Mary conceived Jesus by the Holy Spirit. And the Heavenly Father was his Father. Now, if you turn to John chapter 16, verse 13, you'll see Jesus talking about, and I'll just grab the, the text here, John chapter 16, verse 13, where Jesus talks about the nature of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Revelation, remember, you hear that Jesus speaking to the seven churches. This is Jesus' instruction, I will build my church. Seven different churches in Asia Minor. And at the end of every encouragement and discipleship, Jesus says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So it's Jesus speaking, but then we're told, hear what the Spirit says. So if I turn to, to John chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus says, I, in verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. These young men of 18 to 22 years of age. But he says, when the Spirit of truth comes... He will guide you into all the truth. For he will speak not in his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So in the book of Revelation, we hear Jesus speaking. But then we hear, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. And so, as my friend pointed out, the Holy Spirit in John 16 is listed as he. And therefore, my friend said, this is, the Holy Spirit is a person, distinct from the Father, but united with Jesus, three co-equal persons. So the question that I ask is, is, I've heard other people read this text and say it. So if you look at the first century Greek, it does indeed say, for he will speak on his own authority. Now in English, that sounds like a masculine gender. But in Greek, the word for chair is karekla. So when I refer to a chair, I don't say the chair, I say he chair, or he trapeze, he table. Or if I say the cardigan, I will say she cardigan. Everything in the Greek language is either male or female. So the pronoun in first century in, in, in Greek was correct, was the masculine gender, because you don't have a neuter gender in Greek. Spanish is the same. Very interesting. So in English, you could read that and justify, but with a little bit of Bible study, you can say, okay, this opens it and broadens it even further. And so the Holy Spirit is not assigned a gender in that particular sense. 
What I'm saying in this very short message is we must be very careful in trying to understand the transcendent glory of the divine revelation, not to try to create a humanly devised construct that makes it a bit more convenient for us to understand and put it in a box. Now, when we create a construct, we begin to limit what God is doing. We speak on scripture and on the authority of the Bible alone. We are Bible-based, and that is an essential authority that we have by the Holy Spirit on the scripture and scripture alone, because many places Jesus said, it is written. In the great contest against Satan, he said, it is written. And so we see the Holy Spirit revealed as oil, as wind, as fire, as water, but never as an anthropomorphical image like the Father, Jesus has eyes of blazing fire and legs like burnished brass. Um, I, as we are created in God's image and likeness, when Jesus appeared to us, there was one occasion when he breathed on his disciples and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. So you and I have the very personal presence of God, the Father and the Son dwelling in us, the Holy Spirit. So we are convicted, redeemed, empowered and strengthened. My encouragement is stay within Scripture. Number two, don't allow a humanly devised construct to complicate and make things more difficult or limit our understanding of transcendent reality. Number three, be faithful to what we do know and understand. That is very important. And um, remember that we are Christ-centred, spirit-formed, all spirit-led, Bible-based, Sabbath-celebrating, kingdom-focused and grace-oriented. And we'll talk a little bit more about grace as we go this afternoon. In other words, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says.